Kevin, a Newport lad. Correct. We've also read you're an internationally renowned wedding photographer. <laughs> doing weddings here at home and destination weddings. A champion of the mirrorless camera systems, we can call it that. <laughs> and um, an official Fuji X photographer. Yep. So what happened there then? <laughs> <laughs> Where's Newport in that story? Well, Newport is where I was uh, born and brought up, and I was there until I was around 18, went to university, headed off to um, Bournemouth, where I studied um, management and economics and business studies and all that kind of stuff. Um, although Bournemouth actually is a really well-renowned, now a very well-renowned art uh, especially for filming TV. I think they've had a couple of Oscars or Oscar uh, generating students there. Um, so I did business and management and economics and all that kind of stuff there. From there, I headed off to um, my placement. It was a four-year course. and My placement was at Microsoft in Reading. So I headed off there for a year and then I went back to Microsoft at the end of the university degree. Um, that in turn led me to London where I... Um, worked for um, a company creating um, it was kind of before, it wasn't before the internet but before websites were really popular so I was building applications and business management tools and things like that um, then I became a contractor and started working for people like Deutsche Bank ING Behrens um, BT Salomon Brothers um, starting to build their um, website based systems um, online stuff and I moved from there, my business, I was working for myself then, and my business moved it more towards online marketing um, for people like Grosvenor, PepsiCo, um, did a lot of stuff for them. And in the end, it became a little bit of a chore. Um, my wife and I had moved to the West Country at that point, moved back towards Wales, but didn't quite reach. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was getting up at, I was getting on the train at quarter past five every morning. I was getting home at, you know, half eight every night. Um, this was 10, no, this was 2008, 2009. And the train fare, my monthly train fare was £890 a month. That was then. I, heaven knows what it would be now, but probably well over £1,000. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was expensive. It was tiring. Um, and, you know, I wasn't really spending any time with the family. We'd had a new uh, baby at that point. And so, um, yeah, that's really what led me to the photography route. Up until that point, 2009, I hadn't really, I'd never been interested in photography. I'd never even, um, well, it's not true to say I wasn't interested in it, but I had no skills. I didn't own a camera. Um, you know, I would, um, I still recognized work that I really appreciated. Um, you know, I would always, you know, the work like Jane Bowen and stuff like that and the um, Sunday supplements, I would always gravitate towards that without necessarily understanding anything about photography. And so um, one day I was sat on the train coming back from London reading an article um, about a wedding photographer. And I thought to myself, well, maybe this is the, maybe this is the answer. It can't be that difficult, famous last words. And uh, so I went home and I said to my wife, um, this is what I'm going to do. And she kind of looked at me and said, well, yeah, maybe, but you know, you don't own a camera and you're really quite grumpy and you probably won't be very good at that. Um, so maybe we need to think about something else. Um, but you know, I went, I, you know, I tried it and I went on some, um, I actually did a few kind of workshops before I even shot a wedding. Um, there's a very good documentary wedding photographer up in the North called Jeff Askoff. I went on one of his workshops. Um, and I kind of went that way and just started shooting. My business background helped immensely at that time. I put a website together. Um, I marketed myself, you know, in those days back in, and this was only five, six years ago, really. Mm. There was probably not one in four people on the planet was a wedding photographer, you know, as it is now. It's very difficult. Everybody you know, claims to be a wedding photographer. Um, so it was a bit easier to be seen in the crowd. And the website helped and, and the marketing helped. So, I, you know, I got traction pretty much straight away. And, uh, yeah, and since, uh, you know, I've done, I don't know, 350 weddings since then, something like that. Um, so really, what are we talking about? 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. was you 
what, dying both feet in or did you stay on the day job no I, I i i switched it off completely wow. um i i had a contract with uh who was it with it was grosvenor in uh, mayfair and that was coming to the end and, and actually they said you know what we can um you know we're happy for you to work from home if you like and you know come into london when you need to but i thought no this is the time i'm going to do it otherwise you'll never do it um i'm a big believer in you know if you have if you have a ambition or you you know it, it's easier to achieve something once you start it if you just keep thinking i'm going to do this i'm going to do this it's harder to actually start it start things and then you'll finish them or at least you'll try them so yeah i did my first wedding on um august 9th 2009 and i'd finished with grosvenor um wrapped up the business i turned you know i switched the business off that i was running in london um that finished the previous april so yeah there was no overlap whatsoever um there wasn't really even any kind of money <laughs> left over to you know it was a case of it has to work uh, if it doesn't work um then i'll i'll you know i have to go back to to doing what i was doing and i just really didn't want to do the whole commute and i didn't i didn't n- not enjoy what i was doing but the commute the cost of it you know the the constant treadmill um you know now where i live here in malmesbury which is you know it's a beautiful little market town you know everybody knows everybody we all see each other we all smile we all look at each other in london yeah, it just wasn't like that. It's a terrifying place now when I go back, even though I lived there for 15 years. Um, and, you know, London's a, London's great, but if you're just going there in the morning to work and you're coming back at night, it's, you know, you know it's just this behemoth of people and stuff and noise and, you know, craziness. Um, I'm definitely a quieter type person. Um, and whilst Newport was never really a small market town, um, you know, Malmesbury has, has been home now for the last kind of 10 years or so um and it really has changing that career making that career change has made me appreciate the finer things in life and certainly i made that decision based on certainly well certainly not based on the fact that i was going to make more money um because that's that's not the case um i make enough to 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 live off i'm comfortable um but i don't I, I never made the decision to become a photographer to, you know, start driving Porsches and, you know, and have really fancy holidays six times a year. Um, I have very, uh, you know, the family, the important thing, the family, the most important thing. And the, uh, you know, I've built my business so that the, I spend as little time on it as possible without it being mercenary and as much time as possible out of it. Um, and it's great, you know, I take the kids to school, I pick them up from school, I, you know, we go on, I, I don't work in August, for example, which is really peculiar for a wedding photographer. Um, but, you know, I made the decision while the children are really young, I block out August, I block out half terms, um, and I just don't work them. I don't do it. If it's in the diary, it's blocked out, it's blocked out. Mm-hmm. It means that I have to make business, I have to make hay in other directions, uh, you know, other times of the year. Um, but it's you know that was the decision to spend time with the family you know i've got loads and loads of friends in the industry who especially during the summertime they they run around like headless chickens Mm. and the way that i see um photography and especially kind of wedding and social photography is you you become a uh, you, you choose this type of career it's a vocational selection yeah you don't nobody i don't think anybody goes to school and when they're 14 they go to their career teacher and go yeah i want to be a wedding photographer i just i just you know it just doesn't happen you might want to be a photographer you might want to be a commercial photographer or fashion photographer but generally i think people fall into photography either by accident or through sheer love and then you know by inference that means it's a vocation okay so you must um you must be doing it for the love of it rather than necessarily the um capitalist earnings and you know of course you need to to make the business work um but at the same time if you're not enjoying it because you're stressed or your Mm -hmm. business isn't working or you're taking pictures that you don't want to take then you've got to look at the reasons why you're in it in the first place um that's really important to me and it's one of the reasons why i kind of don't go away from the type of photography that i enjoy shooting for my clients um and you know there's always pressure to do that there's pressure from the industry there's pressure from certain clients um there's certainly pressure from clients before they book um and you know i never want to go to a wedding and come back thinking oh i hated that i mean sometimes it happens of course sometimes you have bad days at the office but 
generally I wake up and I think, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to shoot today the way I want to shoot. I'm going to hopefully deliver pictures that the clients want. Um, it's never an issue to be, I, I never want to be in this situation that I know a lot of people are in where, you know, it's all stress and anger and hatred and, you know, this ball of anxiety as wedding photographers because they've got to do the editing. The clients are asking for this and, the, you know, they're asking them to do shoot shots that they don't want to shoot and, you know, they've got to do their website and their marketing and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm a big believer in pushing away stuff that I don't um, want. So my website and my brand is built not only to attract people who want my style of photography, but as equally important, it's there to push away people, to filter out the people who don't want it. Um, and I think that works quite well. I think probably, I mean, I don't know, there's no scientific figure, but I'm guessing for every one person that picks up the phone and says, you know, Kev, we really like your pictures and we'd like to book you there's probably 20, 30, 40, maybe more who go to the website and think, hmm, yeah, I like these, but it's not what we want. Um, but then I never hear from them. And so that time in my business isn't wasted. I'm not wasting time at meetings and trying to persuade people that they want something that they actually don't. Hmm. So going back, was that, um, it sounds like quite an abrupt life-defining sort of moment mm -hmm. to um, give up the city, mm -hmm. tech, career, I guess. Mm -hmm. When really at a time when the web was still on its way up, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, I was doing um, I was doing some quite major websites and a part of that was the online branding and marketing and kind of SEO elements mm -hmm. of things. In those days, um, and remember we're only talking 2007, 2008, you're right, the, it was all on the way up. The, this whole idea of SEO, search engine optimization, etc., was very um uh, it was mo mostly unknown to, to most people um, black art. it was a very much a black art it was very much a case of doing things dirty to try and get google to rank you high. and of course it's completely opposite these days um and so yeah i kind of gave up all of that stuff i had a um you know I had a lot of experience in that area and itm uh, you know i had you know had all the microsoft development exams i had all of those under my belt um, and a lot of the guys at the time were that I knew were, um, you know, they were taking on bigger projects and, you know, much kind of much more work and much more development stuff. And, you know, and, and I found myself moving towards or being interested more in marketing and branding and online stuff rather than the, the, the technical yeah. coding element of things. And I think as you tend to get older, um, certainly in that industry, you find that managers are ex-coders for example they tend to move away from the technology um you know obviously not all the time but generally um because they become more interested in the business side of things perhaps or they they perhaps they can't keep up with all of the technology mm. um and it's interesting because it's at the same time adobe were um reducing the cost of their create what was called creative suite at the time i think mm. Uh, it used to cost like four and a half grand to get photoshop and um you, you know um illustrator and all that kind of stuff and then suddenly it was really cheap it was really accessible especially to students if you were a student you could get it for you know a couple of hundred pounds and what happened in the web design industry was that all of a sudden there was bedroom coders um they all had they had access to the software hosting was really cheap all of a sudden um they were producing good stuff but they were you know, they're going to school on the Monday or they were eating pizza in their mum's basement, you know, and um, and the whole industry was caving in to that kind of stuff. And then you had the um, Indian um, outsourcing of work, um, you know, that had implications from an economical point of view. So um, things were changing dramatically in the industry and I kind of recognised that. And at the same time, I also realised that I didn't, you know, I have, I'd never worked from anybody other than myself since I was 24 I worked for Microsoft for one year after I left university. And then after that, I worked for myself. And I realized that I'm not, I just couldn't work. I couldn't go and work in a, um, yeah, you know, be managed if you like. Um, and so it was a case of, right, okay, something needs to change dramatically. Um, what are you going to do? And we were moving. My wife and I decided to move and we weren't staying in London. We couldn't afford to stay in London. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just a case of move the business, move what I was doing in London to here because there is no business here for that. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to come here and then do the same thing, traipsing into Bristol every day or traipsing into Cardiff or Bath or Swindon. Um, you know, I wanted a, a complete lifestyle change. It was a gamble. It was a big gamble. Um, but, you know, 
hopefully. So far, it's worked out. I mean, it may sound like an obvious question, but how important was that having that area of marketing online sussed? Being a black art practitioner, if you like the <laughs> SEO site, of you from day one getting yourself online and marketing yourself as a wedding photographer. It was hugely important, uh, hugely important. Um, and I often say to people that being a um, professional anything, whether it's a wedding photographer, whether you're a corporate photographer, or whether you're a plumber, I think 95% of your time is business and 5% is actually doing stuff so you know i shoot a wedding on saturday i've got a wedding coming for eight hours um but here you know i'm doing my website i'm doing marketing i'm answering emails i'm you know putting contracts together and all that kind of stuff uh, you know i'm educating myself and and really the business element of stuff is far more important than the shooting and of course you know you need to clients need to like your pictures that's paramount um but in the first place you need to get them to find your pictures and that's where the business comes into it um but yeah the online stuff the website and the seo um i've always been an advocate of what i would call clean seo so or um seo with integrity rather than trying to fool people to come to your website um i've always been an advocate of doing it the way that google wants you to do it and it's always been the same google have never changed their um web guidelines if you like they've always been the same it's just they've changed the algorithm to try and filter out the people who try and cheat it um so if you didn't try and cheat it then you'll be all right um but a lot of people did you know back in those days um lots of stuff worked to get you up the rankings quicker uh, Google didn't like it and they would complain but the reason they would complain was because it would work and so people would do it and you know uh, it was this ever increasing circle and um, I mean you remember if you typed in something like um, a cottage in West Wales or something all you'd get is just rubbish directories and you'd have to dig deep into Google to find anything of any relevance now you do it you get the right stuff straight away so Google has cleaned up the search engines a lot um, and I think from a, regardless of the business, whatever it is, whether it's wedding photography or, uh, you know, commercial photography, you, you need to be on top of all of that stuff now. Um, and if it's something that you can't deal with, then you certainly need somebody in your trusted circle to do it. Um, and I say trusted circle because it's very easy for people to say that they will do this for you, marketing, SEO, etc., And then they go down the route of the black hat stuff and then the rug is pulled out from under your feet by Google and, you know, businesses can fail. So for the photographer listening who uh, is passionate about making images, um, realises they perhaps need to do a bit more in terms of marketing themselves online, do you want to just describe that whole thing about the content because, and the investment of time, I guess, as mm -hmm. well, and the approach you take in content on your sites to make it work okay. and how you do them? So the most important thing I think for anybody who wants to, um, you know, who needs to do this marketing element of it is you have to enjoy it. You have to have a passion for your own business. You have to have a passion for your own work. And if you have that, then you will, you will enjoy putting blog posts together. You will enjoy putting content together. You'll enjoy writing articles, etc. Until that enjoyment comes, then you will struggle. So that's the very first thing. Um, put yourself in a situation where you can actually enjoy doing it. And if that means you have to um, learn how to use WordPress or learn how to use your content management system, then do it. Don't struggle with it. You know, bat that out of the out of the park straight away. Get rid of the challenges. Once you've got over the hurdles, then you can start enjoying what you're doing. So I um, I blog and I write content on my website probably three times a week. Um, it doesn't actually take that long these days. I'm quite used to the way I do it. I do it in a very formulaic way. Um, but if I'm, for example, yesterday I did a wedding blog post um, and I do probably one of those every couple of weeks, a full wedding. Um, probably takes an hour and a half of my time, including prepping the images, writing the content. Um, the social media ele element of it also is included in that. Um, but I enjoy it. Mm. I actually look forward to doing it. So, um, you know, one of the things that I do on a, when I leave the office tonight, I'll write a list of things that I need to do tomorrow. Um, I actually have it on my um, computer. And what I try and do is I put the stuff that I don't want to do first on that list. Uh, seriously, uh, it's a very simple thing, but it works. And if you're, uh, you know, if you, if you can um, give yourself the control to, to do it in order that you've written it, and what happens is you do the, the boring stuff first. Uh, so, for example, every morning I do my... I update my bank statements or my online accounts. I do my mileage. Um, you know, sometimes obviously I don't have any mileage, but 
uh, doing the account stuff takes five minutes if you do it on a daily basis. If you leave it until the 30th of January, you're going to be in a whole world of pain. So I do it and it's done. It's done. First thing I do again in the morning. Um, and then the web stuff, the marketing, the SEO stuff um, generally comes towards the end of the day when, um, you know, all of the stressy stuff's gone, hopefully. Um, I can sit back, I can relax and, that, and I can enjoy it. And, and it's honestly, I've, I can't tell you how many people I've spoke to and they go, yeah, but, you know, it's all right for you. I hate doing this kind of stuff. And my answer to them is, well, I hate doing accounts and that's why I've got an accountant. I hate doing my, um, you know, logo design and, and physical graphic branded. That's why I outsource it. Um, you know, you don't have to do everything. Um, we have this terminology in the wedding photography world, Uncle Bob. And um, and this Uncle Bob is the guy that comes to the, cam- uh, comes to the wedding uh, with his own camera and basically gets in your way and does everything and annoys you. Um, and clients sometimes will rely on Uncle Bob to get their wedding pictures. And I often say to people in the industry that, you know, we are the Uncle Bobs of other industries. Mm-hmm. So by, um, you know, by hacking around at your accounts or by hacking at a logo design and spending, spending three weeks designing a logo that's rubbish at the end of it, you're the Uncle Bob of the, des- of the logo design industry. Uh, and, it, you know, you don't get anywhere. So, um, you know, realize what you're good at, realize what you're not good at, outsource the stuff or become good at something if you, if you can. Um, but the most important thing, honestly, when it comes to the content, when it comes to writing about your own stuff, is that you have to enjoy it. You know, you have to be proud of your work too. That's really important. Um, it, you know, the wedding photography world is a, as is all of the photography world, it's a very, um, obviously it's a very visual industry. And also there's all kinds of eyes on you from um, not your clients, but everybody else. All Anybody else who sees you as, um, a competitor or sees you as a local person or whatever they're going to be looking at your pictures um, so you know don't ever worry about putting pictures online thinking never think about your peers is, is the point I'm making always think about your future clients um, when you're using your mark when you're putting stuff together on your website um, if you do that and you're proud of your work then put it up there don't worry about what other people think um, you know, for example I once had a conversation with somebody who said um a photographer who said, yeah, I really like your pictures, but, you know, there's a whole load of um, hugging and all that kind of stuff going on. And on the very same day, I had a call from a potential client. She said, I love your pictures. I love all the hugging and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and I know for, you know, I know for a fact that people, that's what they like. You know, the clients like that. I don't care really what other photographers think about it. Um, Of course, it's nice to be recognized, but it's at the same time, I'm not making money from them. It's far more important that the, the clients are, uh, you're putting something in front of the clients that A, you want to shoot and B, they want to receive. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a style defining thing, I suppose. But the at the end of the day, you have to be happy with it. You, If you're not confident with your own stuff, um, for either physically, artistically, or from a business point of view, um, you know, nobody else will be confident in it either. So, you know. I guess that... Um determination well, and you realise the importance of revisiting some of those weddings, some of that work I guess the easy ones are the ones that have just passed you know, from a few weeks back yeah. but do you find yourself appreciating and reviewing your work more by having to go in and verbalise and describe it yeah, for other audiences? Um, it's quite interesting really that you mentioned the couple of weeks so I actually typically don't blog weddings for around about nine months wow. after the wedding um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The um, obviously they get edited and it goes to the clients. Um, but f- um, in real terms, this time of the year now, before Christmas, is when, um, as a wedding photographer point of view, people should be really populating their content, putting their website together. Because January and February time is the busy inquiry period. That's a statistical fact. Uh, you know, if you go into W. H. Smith's on New Year's Day, you'll see loads of bridal magazines. Um, and it's because people choose to plan their, they put off planning their wedding until after Christmas. And, you know, they get to 2016 and they think, oh my word, the wedding's in 2016, we've done no planning. Um, so it makes sense to, you know, I, I kind of backlog most of the blogs, the wedding blogs, until the winter months. Mm. Um, because Google is hungry for the stuff then. Um, clients are hungry for the stuff then. And most other wedding photographers have done it all in the summer when it's having less impact. Mm. So um, from a business point of view, that makes sense. Um, but also, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a time thing. In the summertime, uh, you know, I'm, 
I'm busy shooting weddings. I'm busy on holiday. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, it's it's less important. Um, and so, you know, I use kind of every single inquiry I get, I, I note down. So I can look very easy at statistics and it tells me that, yeah, January, February, if I'm going to do any kind of paid marketing or I'm going to do any marketing whatsoever, that's when I'm going to do it. So I use the statistics that I've got in the business to tell me, to educate me about this stuff. Um and when it comes to actually, so the wedding I did yesterday was from March, for example. I did them all in order. Um, none of them get missed off. And um, so I'm up to like the early this year's weddings. Um, and when you look at the pictures, you do, it does take you right back. Um, and because of the way that I shoot in a documentary style, there is no, uh, you know, I don't have to just put loads of group shots and stuff online. It's actually, it's hopefully storytelling stuff. And it does because I was there at those, that moment in time where the picture was taken, I can actually, usually generally remember it. Um, but on that point about reviewing your past work, yeah, of course, you know, I, I, I was doing some stuff for um, a panel I've entered and I was looking at some pictures from five, six years ago and they're very, very different, very different. Um, and I think that's that's quite a diplomatic way of <laughs> saying it. Um, but it's a good thing. And hopefully in five years' time, my pictures then will be very different to my pictures now. Um, you know, hopefully a lot better. Um, but yeah, I mean, you it's constant review and constant, um, you know, also constant worrying um, about how, you, how you're getting on. Um, but really, you know, you just got to, you've got to really, really um, take the bull by the horns, you know, uh, love it, love the stuff. I mean, I put, I don't know, what, 60 pictures online yesterday. Um, and my criteria for it, for a picture that I put on my website is if it makes me smile, as long as it makes me smile, then then it'll it makes the cut, um, and that's that's pretty much it. One of the um, it's interesting that this thing about going back and revisiting work. One of the things we've touched on with a couple of other photographers, um, interestingly, guys who shoot film or uh -huh. have in the past shot film, they kind of lament that they didn't keep a journal or keep some information on what they'd shot, where it was, you know, in that folder and eggs mm. or contact sheets. Um, but in your world and where you've come from, uh, and I've heard you speak before about this, but do you want to just describe the importance of the modern day journal, the metadata, what you, the time you invest in mm -hmm. the images as well, you've done your selects? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so if we are talking about a wedding, then it's, um, you know, you'll often shoot a lot more pictures than you're going to give the client. Um, I, I, I I mean, I haven't actually checked this, but I'm guessing my hit rate is probably one in three. So if I deliver them 400 pictures, I'm probably pressing the button 1,200 times on a wedding day. Um, and so you do end up with a lot of pictures. You end up with a lot of pictures that you're not going to actually do anything with. Um, I use Photo Mechanic uh, as my culling tool, which is much quicker than Lightroom. Um, and I just literally whip through uh, the images. I don't actually do any keywording or anything because the way that I organize my Lightroom workflow is that um, at the end of the, once a wedding is completed, and also this is true for my street photography and any kind of other work, it all goes into a, a large finals Lightroom catalog, which is archived by year, by month, by project. Um, and so for weddings, I don't really need to know um, venue. I never need to worry about where venues are and things like that. I can always look that up and, and go to it straight away. Um, but for the, the kind of street photography and everything like that, then I will um, bring them into Lightroom and keyword them there. I don't do any of that stuff mm -hmm. in Photo Mechanic. Um, and you know, when you're um, when you're shooting um, project based stuff rather than wedding based stuff, it is more important to to keep track of it. Um, up until about two years ago, I wasn't really doing any of that stuff, and you know, you do get frustrated. Um, and even actually just stuff running around the house with the kids and everything. Um, so many pictures you take on your phone and everything, you know, it just gets lost, it just goes into the cloud or it goes onto your computer. Um, and whilst I have all of those images, sometimes, you know, I often find myself searching by camera because I can almost nearly always remember what camera I use to take pictures. So I use that metadata to, to dig into it. Um, but, you know, from a wedding point of view, I don't really need to worry about it. I'm not fussed on that. Um, but certainly kind of the project based, the, uh, the um, uh, documentary or street photography stuff, it is more important to track it. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really 
conscious of is overshooting. And so um, when I'm out on the street shooting, I you know I give myself very defined projects, um, which means that you know it could be it could just be very simple. It could be the color red, for example. Um, and that means by by giving yourself you know you're galvanizing yourself to really shoot less and um, you know shoot less and deliver more really because you know you're looking you're becoming an observer which is something that I I talk about all the time you know I don't really refer to it as being a photographer as such and kind of an observer uh, certainly for weddings um, anybody can press the button on the camera but you have to look and watch and see um, but yeah you from an archival point of view it's something that. Um, yeah, I think in a few years' time, I'll probably wish I'd done slightly different, as like every you know, everybody does. I think, um, but I'm happy with it. You know, it's all it's all there. It's all it's all kind of accessible and, and achievable. I never shot with film, so I don't have any of those um, issues, and I also don't have the worries that may have been introduced to people in those days. Um, you know, ever been tempted? Um, I have film cameras. I have them. I have some oh, stuff up there. Yeah. Them, yeah. Um, and yeah, I've shot with them. I mean, I've shot with them. I have gone out and shot with them. Um, <laughs> I would never shoot a wedding um, with them because, <laughs> you know, the way I shoot in documentary style, it's um, there are there are going to be photographers out there who could do it. Absolutely. Um, I'm not one of those people. Definitely not. Um, I need to, you know, I need to have confidence that the images that I'm getting are exposed correctly and stuff. Um, What's your view? Just interesting. Um, there are a couple to try and, I guess, and I can understand it, differentiate themselves in the uh, very saturated field of wedding photography. Mm-hmm. There are uh, the modern day, some of them are younger uh, photographers who, are, I guess, are trying to offer, and we'll talk about Fuji in a minute, the Instax, mm-hmm. you know, the old Polaroid feel, or they're maybe saying, I'll guarantee you a roll of 35 mil. Mm-hmm. Um, for that, it's almost like they're touching on those heartstrings of the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the proper analog, the real photography almost. Um, but God, that's got to be slowing them down. Day. Well, it will be, and um, uh, yeah, I always think that if you, it, it all goes back to the vocational thing, right? And I think that if you're, if people are offering these, um, and they're not necessarily gimmicks, they they could well be something that they're really interested in they really want to do it but if you're just offering it because you want to um, stand out from the crowd and and use it as a marketing technique but actually it's difficult for you to do it then it's it's not a good practice you know if you generally I I, I know there's a girl I know who shoots weddings entirely on film um, and she sends the um, she sends the canisters off to Los Angeles it's the only lab she trusts in Los Angeles so every wedding she shoots she then trusts British Airways or whichever mm. freight it's going in to go to LA and come back again. Um, and that, but that's not part of her marketing. It's not. Um, I shoot your wedding on film. You know, look at me. Yeah. I shoot your wedding on film. Yeah. I, I can't even remember seeing it on her website. You know, she just shows these beautiful pictures. Mm. These, these beautifully you know, scanned images are amazing. I, I mean, um, I think that's fantastic. That yeah, purest approach. That's a Absolutely. confidence thing in itself, isn't it? With the pressure of a day. Completely, and you've got to know that camera. What yeah, doing in terms yeah, of lighting. completely. Um, and she wouldn't do it any other way. Mm. That's her. That's the way she does it. Um, and now I think, I mean, people do it, uh, gravitate to her because they know this. I think, um, but by and large, it's not her um, uh, unique selling point. Okay, even though it probably is technically a unique thing. Um, so she does it. But you know, yeah, you know, you get these guys who. Um, who are yeah we'll come we'll do your wedding and we'll also film it we'll also do a GoPro stop motion we'll also run a, a, a reel of film off and we'll instax all of your guests uh, you know I mean it really does take away from the core uh, results I, I you know I honestly think that um, and you know one of the reasons I've kept my my um, the editing of my images have always been the same all the black and whites um you know, I mean, it's dependent on types of monitors and, and you know things like that. But generally, they're all they're all the same: deep black and white, slightly um, warm tone. Mm. Um, the colours are very are filmic, edited to be filmic, mm. um, if there's a real word. Um, but it's always been that way. I've not changed it. And um, you know, I think having a uniformity in your editing style and your um, delivered images is is going to be good for your brand. Um, you know, kind of dipping in and out of processing styles I think in the long term will be damaging um, I mean how many times I look at my parents wedding album and they're just beautiful black and whites completely timeless they're the same as the black and whites I try and produce now um, 
I look at um, other family members' wedding albums, and you know it's you know white soft focus um modern ones are really over vintage look digital vintage mm. you're going to look at those in 20 years time and think my word you're not going to look at the image and think oh yeah remember this you're going to look at the pictures and think my god look how outdated those pictures look um whereas i think if you just go down the route of natural you know i don't kind of over process i don't i don't um you know a lot of the guys will do very very hdr styled mm. And they're beautiful. They're beautiful portraits, especially. A lot of the Asians do this, um, or the Asian market. And they are wonderful images. But for me, that's digital art. It's not the, the photograph. And they admit it. You know, I'm not, it's not wrong that they do this. It's part of their, you know, we will create a digital picture for you. Um, but the time spent, and, and then at the end of it, you know, it's, in my mind, it's not a photograph. It's a digital piece, a digital art piece, which is fine. Um, and, you know, the way that I work is everything is pretty much out of the camera um yeah i'm on a might dodge and burn a little bit crop straighten um but other than that there's nothing you know i don't kind of remove things i don't edit things i don't over process i don't use comp uh, composites or anything like that mm -hmm. um and that and that's because that's what i like uh, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong but it's it's what I, I prefer to do um and so i think when you you know the, the guys that dip in and out of different fashionable editing processes um you know just stick with what you like if what you like is a very vintage you know, mm. thing, then go for it, mm. but stick with it and make it part of your brand rather than um, just following the trend and then actually hating it. Mm. I mean, your images do stand out. Um, you have that. People, I think, can obviously see, you mentioned earlier, you've got a distinctive style that you want people to book you for. Um, but I'm interested, I know you do shoot colour as well, mm -hmm. but have you had clients coming up saying, Kevin, love the work love that reportage you know the guest shooting the wedding type discreet style mm -hmm. but can you do them in colour for it's rather than black and white have you ever had that occasionally um, um, what well, before the wedding it happens yeah. occasionally yeah, yeah 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 so sometimes clients will say uh, you know how much colour images can we get um, and again it comes down to this brand so on my most weddings will yield about 20% colour okay so 80% black and white 20% colour maybe 70 and so the website is geared that way. Mm. So there's a rare, approximately 70% black and white images on the website. The PDFs I send them, approximately 70% black and white. So they have, it's in their mind, it's in their, it's like the psychology of their their product buy-in is, mm. is based on that. Um, but occasionally I do get the question, usually from brides, the grooms typically gravitate towards the black and white stuff. I don't know whether it's a masculine thing or not, but the brides. Um, and what I say to them is, look, you know, if color is a feature of the image, if the reason the, the image should be taken is because of color, then it will be in color. Um, if it's if it's because of if the picture is being taken because of emotion or human interaction or, you know, whatever, then it, the chance that it would be in black and white, because I think personally that helps me gravitate to what's going on in the story um and occasionally i've uh, you know definitely on one occasion last year uh, you know i've lost a book in because they were adamant they wanted all images in black and white and color you know and i, I just, you just say no you just oh, can't they were they yeah it they wanted it yeah and and i don't work that way you know i shoot um i shoot a lot of jpeg stuff so i can't i mm. can't convert from black and white to color mm. it's just not possible um and so you know you you have to stand up for yourself and and kind of do it that way and occasionally after the wedding i've had a few times where people have said i really like that picture but you know my mum wants it in color um and i will normally shoot the ceremony in raw plus jpeg so the ceremony ones i can usually convert i can usually get away with that um but i will always do it with an element of well, okay, um, you know, and I'll explain to them why it's in black and white. I'll explain to them first why it's like this. Um, but if your mum really, really wants this picture in colour, I can do it for her. But I won't add it to the gallery. I won't add it to the um, to their, you know, their final selection or anything. I'll do it and I'll email it. You know, I might say, give me your mum's email address and I'll send it to her directly. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a very, you know, there's a very um, important reason that things are done in black and white or in colour. And, you know, I have this... If you do do black and white and color work, then I think if you're doing a whole body of work, you know, like a wedding is 400 pictures, you know, there's a lot of stuff to deliver. And of course, they're not all going to be um, hero pictures or portfolio type pictures. 
Um, but at the end of the day, the clients and their family and friends are going to look at this body of work. And I think, you know, I, I have this idea of islands of color and islands of black and white. So I don't, I don't want to just have a random color image thrown in amongst eight black and white pictures. It just doesn't, doesn't sit well. Um, so you, you know, you have to be, you have to be, um, uh, what's the word? You, ha- you have to stand up for yourself and you have to be kind of conscious of what you want to do also at the same time as educate, trying to educate them. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does happen. I do shoot a lot of black and white and it all goes back to that branding thing, doesn't it? For the people that come to the website, many of them might go, oh, we didn't do much color. And so, you know, we'll go off to someone else who does do color. Um, so hopefully by the time they've kind of got through and if they, if they read the stuff on the website of which there's lots, um, they should get an idea. You know, I have a whole page dedicated to black and white. Um, and I even have an image on there where they can scroll up and down. Um, on the black and white page they can drag it thing and the image the same image converts to black and white color as they drag it up and down um and you know and i talk to them about why and in that case why that color should be or why that image should be in color um you know and I, it's really about educating them but in, you know i enjoy writing this stuff i enjoy talking to them about it i enjoy talking to clients about this stuff so um the, the management element of things client management is all there and it's really not much of an issue i don't worry about it put it mm-hmm. that way um as much as some other photographers who talk to me and they say well you know i'd love to do what you do but i'm too scared i'm too scared to put all documentary pictures all black and white on there um so they will never go that route mm-hmm. because if they if they stay with the traditional photography on their website, that's what they're going to, mm. the clients are going to want. I mean, you're obviously, so on that point on colour, you're obviously very particular um, about the images you want to give that client because they never see what you've shot at the wedding until you deliver no. yeah. the book, I guess. Or, or, or. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you do just the images? Uh, I, they all get the digital images, right. but most of them, uh, I'd say 80% of them, get an album too. Um, the albums are, um, they're part of the packages. So all the packages come with an album, but sometimes we might have a discussion about if it's a midweek or something like that and they need to reduce the price. You know, I'm not, uh, it's a business. Mm. It's not, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to discuss things if, if necessary to, you know, if it's not a core date or whatever. But I do really want them to have albums. Um, so albums are part of the packages as a general starting point. Um, uh, but yeah, they do all get the digital yeah. images. So too. when you've gone through the images and you've deemed that colour image to be one that you want to give that. that's quite a decision for you isn't it because that 70 over maybe 70 percent in some cases black and white images here, here comes one that's really going to stand out um coming back from 2009 then do you find yourself getting more refined in the choice of more mm. picky about the kind of images you're shooting yeah absolutely um and if i look at the way that i used to shoot when um you know, it's not a camera specific thing, but when I was shooting with my DSLR, um, I used to do, I used to shoot on, um, what they call it, motor drive or the equivalent of high speed burst a lot. Um, and you'd shoot a lot of images and it's very arbitrary in terms of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost spray and pray. Um, you'd have thousands and thousands of images. Um, now as time has gone by, regardless of what camera I'd be using, I definitely try and, um, I kick myself in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in when I'm out there shooting at a wedding and I think, right, slow down, watch. And I put the camera down. And sometimes I'll talk to clients about this in the beginning. And I'll say to them, look, you know what? I'm many times at the wedding, you won't see me with my camera to my eye um, because I'm not there to just run around going click, 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 click. Um, you know, I'm going to watch the characters. I'm going to watch where the light is. I'm going to look. I'm going to try and analyze what's going to make a good picture. And of course, you know, you're going to, you have to get the key things. You have to get the bride walking up the aisle and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you, at the same time, you want to deliver them something from their client, uh, sorry, from their guest side point of view. And that's what I focus on. Um, so often that's not the bride and groom. You know, I've, I've done, I've shot weddings where I haven't even shot them doing their first kiss. So I've shot, you know, the granny up the end of the aisle watching them do their first kiss, for example, you know, and, and things like that. And it's, it's this idea of, um, being an observer rather than a photographer, I think, is is kind of important for this style of photography, at least. And I don't mean that to sound arrogant in any way, shape, or form. But I, you know, the question about refining the style is more about um, refining what I see. I think mm-hmm. rather than I'm much more aware of light and things now. Um, you know, I used to shoot with a um, Canon One DX, which 
you know, the ISO would go up to like, I don't know, 128,000, something like that. So all I would do is ride the exposure compensation dial and expect the camera to deal with it. It's a very lazy way of doing it, but it was good, you know, it mm. did its job. Mm. Um, and now, you know, I don't have the luxury of shooting at 128,000 ISO. So I look for light more and meter more sensibly. Um, and the pictures are more um, refined in that respect, for sure. Um, you know, and, you know, when you shoot a lot of weddings, you can, under- you know that if it's a bright sunny day and people are outside, then normally the, um, when they're all mingling for the drinks reception, normally that's going to be, they're going to be colour, it's going to be a colour series um, because, you know, there's flowers, there's bright dresses, colourful dresses, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, with this idea of islands of colour and islands of black and white, you know, you typically you will go for it and you understand um, the flow of the day. A winter wedding, for example, the weddings I have um, coming up now, three weddings the next couple of weeks, they will be more, probably 90%, maybe even higher black and white. Because winter weddings often are later in the day, the colours are more muted, um, you know, it's the weather is more muted, it's dark at, you know, three o'clock. So, you know, seasonal elements come into play too. Definitely. So just ending on the colour side then, um, you've moved what, exclusively now to Fuji from the Canon gear? You Fuji, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, you're this official Fuji X photographer, but you must have, it must be really interesting having adopted those very early cameras, I think it was the X100, mm-hmm. first for you, trusting the, the colour settings are great in the Fujis. Do, I'm mm-hmm. interested in whether you... When you switch to colour and shoot colour on some of those raw files then, are you tweaking those much when you get them back in? Um, a bit, not a lot. Do you um, shoot JPEG colour? Yeah, so. JPEG in colour too. Um, now, the thing about the move to the Fuji thing was that it introduced the electronic viewfinder. Mm. Um, so what you're seeing in the viewfinder is what you're going to get. Um, so you don't, you know, if you're going to overexpose or underexpose, it's going to tell you in the viewfinder, you, you're good to go. So you can shoot more JPEG. Um, and you can't, you know, you're not kind of just thinking, oh, I wonder, it's using the um, histogram to decide and everything. Um, so the color stuff, yeah, for the Fujis that I use, um, they have the um, film simulation called Classic Chrome, um, which is great. You know, I love it. I love it to bits. It crushes the blacks. It does everything I want. It's almost spot on to the finished color image that I need. Um, black and whites, they have... Um, black and white film simulations I use um, a red filter there's an option for a red filter which is a very contrasty black and white um, I do that and then I add the, the warmth afterwards um, like I say I have to straighten quite a few things um, but the yeah it's mostly done in camera the JPEG stuff honestly it's 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 so simple it's so quick um, and you know actually even when I shot Canon I did shoot JPEG plus RAW um, and I would use the camera, I think it's called Camera Vivid Profile in, in the Canon systems. And that actually gave quite a crunchy JPEG. Um, but, you know, the whole point of the, the shooting JPEG is that, um, you know, you have to be happy with the images that it's producing, obviously. But it's a workflow thing. Um, you know, I, I once I had this conversation with somebody once about a 1DX. And he was like, you know, I can't believe you shoot you shoot JPEG on your Canon, on your 1DX. You know, it's a 5,000 pen camera. And my, and my counter argument was, well, I can't believe you spent 5,000 pen on a camera and don't trust it to do the thing it's meant to do, which is produce the images. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, and I still stand by that. And of course, it's not for everybody to shoot JPEG. And certainly if you if you have to do a lot of retouching or, you know, it's it's portrait work or whatever, then it's, you know, it's very different. But I think for street photography and candid wedding photography and social photography, um, when you have to deliver, when you're charged with delivering a lot of images, then I think you have to look at the workflow elements. Um, you know, from a business point of view, again, it, it sounds quite anal, but it's not as bad as it sounds. I do track how much time I spend on each project, each wedding, um, you know, very roughly. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll put in, if I have meetings and I, if I have, you know, the time at the wedding, etc., And then in post-production, how long I spend post-production. Um, and the more time you spend doing this stuff, your bottom line is going to be decreased. You know, your profit per hour. Um, I'm a big, big believer that most wedding photographers in the UK would earn more money per hour flipping burgers at McDonald's than doing weddings because they spend way, way, way too much time, especially on post-production, you know, social media, all that kind of stuff, um, than is necessary. And that's not a bad thing. It's fine if time is um, a luxury for you. Um, 
But if it's not, then, you know, you, you, and, and until people start tracking that, until people start looking at how much money they're making per hour, then they won't realize. Is it really a career? Is it, re- yeah, is it really a business mm. that's working? Um, I used to take, when I first started, it used to take me about two weeks to edit. I used to shoot, I used to edit everything in black and white, everything in color, everything in sepia. And I, and I ridiculously, I edited all of the images before doing the selections. Uh, you know, bonkers, absolutely bonkers. <laughs> and, um, and then I, you know, and then I was looking at this ratio and thinking, I'm earning, you know, like two pound an hour. This is, this can't be right. Um, and you know, if it takes you, if you earn a thousand pounds in five hours and you, or you earn a thousand pounds in a week's worth of work, it's still a thousand pounds, but it's your time. That's, that's the important thing, you know? And so, you know, I went on workflow courses. I went, I you know, sorted out. I moved. I went away. Moved away from. Um, I was using Bridge and started using Lightroom. Uh, you know, and and really nailed that. Um, and of course, you know, I'm always learning different things. But from a workflow point of view, I think I'm I'm quite happy. Um, and one of those decisions was to start shooting JPEG when the mirrorless stuff came around because it frees up so much time. You know, just simple things like card management is quicker. Um, editing is far far quicker. Um, far far quicker and you know you you really if people want to do this as a business then they have to look at that bottom line and what they're making on the bottom line I guess um, still today uh, word of mouth recommendation is quite quite important Um, and I think in weddings it's quite a common theme that you know the bridesmaids are there at the wedding are likely to be a bride themselves pretty shortly mm-hmm. um, in a lot of cases uh, so that word of mouth recommendation and, and you know people talk so I guess they may share or how much did Kevin charge you mm-hmm. for, for that wedding so if you are putting too much work in and doing a job far too cheaply, mm. that's the expectation on the next client, isn't it? Completely. If they know the background to the job. Yeah, completely. Um, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's just that we all start somewhere and, you know, we all charge, um, you know, lower rates when we started and perhaps even do some stuff for free. But you have to move to a, a, a sustainable point pretty quick. Um, you know, uh, it's, it sounds boring as hell, um, but it's, yeah, it's important to do a business plan because... My business plan tells, you know, my goals in my business plan are the holidays and the time off, um, the time out of the business. That's my rewards. Um, and so much like an IT system is, you know, you design an IT system backwards. You start with the the final, we need to produce a report that does this, right? How do we do it? What are the inputs, etc.? So when I do my business plan, I start with the outputs. I need to spend this much time away from the business. And at the same time, I need to earn this much money mm. to pay the mortgage, pay pay for the car, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I work backwards into that element rather than, um, mm, okay, well, if I charge £400 a wedding, then, um, you know, that sounds quite good. You know, just kind of finger in the air type mm. stuff. Um and, and you know, and don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people who you know shoot weddings on the weekends. They work during the week, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's a you know it's a lifestyle choice, and that's good for them. Um, I'm talking specifically about people who want to you know, make a business out of it. It's tough. You know, it's a tough. It's a tough industry. Photography generally, I think, is a tough industry. Um, but, but it's it, got to be getting tougher. The it, wedding set. Yeah, you know, ah, absolutely. Uncle Bob's buying the Fuji XT1. Yeah, he? he's buying yeah. the X100 T. Yeah, because he can't afford, perhaps in some cases, the yeah. five D Mark Three. So the pressure on wedding photographers to do it smarter. I mean, it's going to be great work, and, and yours is. But um, I mean, if you were to f- reflect candidly now, here we are, what the end of two thousand and fifteen. What do you see as the as a picture for the next couple of years in terms of wedding photography? I think the um, you're right. There's every you know throw a ball at the window and you'll hit a wedding photographer. That's what I would say. Um, and um, I think over the next few years, I think it will get worse in terms of numbers. But I actually I, I am positive in that. I think clients are becoming more appreciative of photography. And believe it or not, I believe I think that's down to things like Instagram, Facebook, etc. Because although photography is far more accessible to them and they're far more likely to, you know, f- put a picture on Facebook and copy it and what have you, actually now I think because they're being exposed to so much of it, people are generally becoming more aware of what's good and bad. 
discerning. Yeah, more discerning. And whereas a couple of years ago, you know, people are like, oh yeah, my phone does pictures and, you know, I just run this really nice filter on it and look, it looks great. And actually now those same people are thinking, well, you know what, actually it doesn't look so good. And maybe, there's, you know, there's this there's point in getting a professional. Um, but but re- yeah, it's, it is a very saturated market. You know, I'm a great believer in that if if the, if the industries look after each other, then they, they will look after the industry. And so, you know, I I worry a little bit about the guys who are shooting, um, you know, under pri- under charging. They're they're very good photographers, um, but perhaps they don't need to charge so much because they've, you know, they've got another income or they've you know they've, they they have a lot of money in the bank and, and good for them. I, you know, I wish I was in that situation sometimes. Um, but the business element should still be the same. So I would encourage those people to um, still do a business plan, still you know base it on a business rather than their their um, other disposable income, and then that will give them a price they need to charge. It will give them a realistic price, um, and that will then support the whole industry. Um, of course, you know I'm talking, I'm dreaming here. This isn't going to happen. You're always going to get people who undercut. You're always going to get people who think, well, I don't need, you know, I can just charge four hundred pounds because I just want cash in hand. Um, but you know, I think realistically, people who want to do it semi-seriously, whether they have a day job or not, semi-seriously, need to to do this kind of stuff because you get burnt out. You know, um, my second year, I did sixty-nine weddings, um, and uh, you know, it it was it was hard, really hard. Um, and it was at the end of that year that I basically doubled my prices, shot half the weddings, took you know, booked off the August, did all of that kind of stuff, really refined it. Um, and, but I know guys now, I still know people now who, who are shooting weddings. They're doing 50, 60 weddings a year. Um, some of them love it. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Some of them love it and they charge really well for it and they're making a lot of money. Um, but there are others who aren't charging enough and they're doing 60 weddings and they're burning out and they hate it. They hate it. They hate it. They hate it. And I say to them, well, put your prices up, put your prices up to be more realistic. Uh, but then I won't get, you know, where I live, people won't pay for that, etc. And And it's just not true because, you know, if you, there's always people around who will pay. There's a price point for everybody, of course. But I think that barrier, that middle range barrier between, say, £1,000 and £1,500, um, there are more photographers in that battlefield than above it mm. and even below it. Um, and, you know, you can use price as a... Um, the only person I've ever known um, who has used price successfully as a unique selling point is a person who basically charges really low rates. He'll come to your wedding. He'll shoot your wedding um, on high-speed burst with a big memory card. And at the end of the day, he just gives you the memory card. Okay? There's no art in it. It's all spray and pray. He charges. But his unique selling point, and it's an, you know, from an economical point of view, it makes it works. He basically says, and he shoots every single day, he's shooting a wedding every day, um, this is what I'm going to do. And it is a unique selling point. That his, he's chosen price as his unique selling point. Um, but what he hasn't done is then introduced loads of difficulties to himself in terms of editing and processing. He walks away from the wedding, that's it. You know, it's done. His job's done. Six hours, you know, here's your memory card. Um, now, of course, I don't. My, that's not something I would want to do, and I wouldn't encourage necessary people to do it. But he—he's the only person I know who's actually used price as a unique selling point in that respect. I've never heard that. But did he train as a photographer? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. He shoots everything on um, medium fine JPEG, and boom, there you go. It's just the way he does like things. Sounds like a plumber done good. <laughs> yeah, probably is. Um, but he has done good. You know, he has done good. That's that's the thing about it. Um, you know, he he's artistically wise. I don't know. I've not looked at any of the pictures, but you know, he doesn't care about that. And the clients, he knows that there's a client. You know, there are clients out there who only have three hundred pounds to spend, yeah. and that's his market. You know, this is what I'm going to do, and you're going to get your pictures at the end of the day. You know, that's his marketing thing, um, and it works for him. But the, the the real problem is for the people who are charging way too little and they're spending way too much time. And it goes down to this price uh, per hour thing. Um, you, you know, if you're shooting any kind of commercial work, it's the same. You know, it has to make sense on a on a profit ratio level. You, you know, we, we go back to this idea of it being vocational and... You know, which it is, but you still have to make sure you understand the business elements of it. Otherwise, that vocation would just be a, uh, you know, you're just going to fall out of love with it in the end. It would become way too stressful. Um, concentrate on your prices. Use the business plan to tell you what your price is. It's very simple. You know, you put your outputs in, you decide what you need to live off, and then you can, the business plan will actually tell you 
what you need to charge to live. And then you can decide whether you want to charge a bit more, a little bit less, do you want to do a, bit, a few more holidays. Um, and, you know, it's not, as, it's not always as simple as that, of course, because you have economic factors such as, um, you know, the, the, the depressions and all that kind of stuff that come along. You get, um, if you are in a geographical area where there's lots of other photographers, you know, you have competition and everything. Um, but, you, you know, you, you have to start with the base. That's the base point. It has to be. Um, you can't just come into the industry and go, um, yeah, I think 500 pound will do. I'm sure that sounds like quite a lot of money to me, <laughs> you know, and then go for it because it will, you'll, you'll fail. Mm. You know, you'll, you'll hate it. You'll fail. You might not, you might, you might not fail in terms of, you know, not getting the bookings, but you'll fail from a um, business point of view. If you, if you had to go back, so just leaving the weddings, but if you had to go back six, seven years and, and think, right, I was going to get into the wedding photography industry again as a as a profession what, what do you regard as perhaps the best training approach in terms of skills and getting yourself immersed in it what's the best way to learn well and have some principles in terms of a professional photographer uh, I, th- I honestly think um, you know I'm very lucky in that I'm not shackled by traditional training okay and by that I mean I haven't gone to um, a wedding photography mentor which a lot of people do and you know being told that you have to stand your bride like this and the fingers need to be pointed this way and you have to get pictures of the rings with the groomsmen and all this kind of stuff um, and and I think that was probably my lucky break really so that I've always shot in a way that I've wanted to shoot I'm not I don't have these kind of worries and concerns um, and so I, I, I'm not sure about formal training like that in a wedding photography world I would be more, I would advise people more to look at um, the style that they want to shoot. Now, if they want to shoot very formal wedding photography, of which there's lots of people who do and they do it beautifully, then yeah, of course, there's there's people out there. Um, I would suggest they find a mentor rather than just go on random one day courses. Most of the courses these days I find are, those types of courses are geared towards portfolio building. So the tutor will, well, for your, they'll find a nice pretty model, they'll stand them up against the wall, they'll set the lights, they'll set the camera up and you just click the button and then you go home and put those on your website and say, look, I can do this at your wedding, which you, know, you can't. Um, there's a lot of that that goes on um, and I don't think you necessarily learn much from that. I, I, you know, I, I seriously, I would advise people to, do, to look at um, a long-term mentor who will talk to you about business, um, mostly business. You will find your style when it comes to photography. Um, you know, understand the camera, understand business, understand your style. And if your style is documentary, books, street photography books, photo books, um, all of that kind of stuff really is influential stuff. The internet is full of useful information. Um, you know, about light and metering and, and all of these things that really in the beginning I didn't understand that well. Um and you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I seriously don't think it's that worthwhile to just go on these these one day mm-hmm. courses. Um, teach yourself to be a wedding photographer in a day. I did them. I went on them too, and I, you know, and I, but I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn the stuff that I really needed to learn. Were you ever tempted to request? You know, to assist or be a second shooter? Ah, yes. And I did do that, actually. Did. I did that for two weddings. A guy, a really good guy up in Birmingham called uh, Steve Corson. Um, very different style. Um, but he, he was um, kind enough. I put a message out on a forum um, and he was kind enough to say, yeah, come along. Um, and so I went along with him. And actually what that did was it helped me decide on the, the stuff I didn't want to do rather than the stuff I wanted to do, you know? Um, so Steve, um, what be. yeah, exactly. And Steve's a fine photographer, a great photographer. Um, and he, you know, and he was doing all the group shots and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I kind of thought, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure I want to do this. Um, but, you know, and so, yeah, it helped in that respect. So yeah, absolutely. You know, reach out to people in your area. Um, they can often help and they usually will, you know, most, most guys have got integrity and most people are helpful. Um, you know, I say most, not everybody, of course. Um, some people won't tell you anything, um, but you know, you 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 know, you know, absor- absorb the industry, absorb the good things that are out there. Podcasts like this, and you know, there's loads of stuff on the internet and interviews and things like that. I think it's really important. You can normally see when people are telling a woolly story or they're pulling, you know, pulling the fluff over your eyes. Um, 
you know, but like I say, I think if, if people look after the industry, the industry will look after them. I mean, YouTube, I guess, and iTunes in some ways is saturated with videos, <clears throat> podcasts. I mean, I've spoken to you about this before. I think I asked you a question a while back about um, the content you put in your site. And I think you did say then you were quite interested in video. But what, what do you think about those different types of media mm-hmm. to reach, I guess, different types of audience? Because some people will listen to a podcast, but some people would prefer to see pictures and watch the video. Sure. As well. Yeah, I um, from it's really interesting point because from an SEO point of view, Google actually likes moving media these days. So I do um, what um, what we call photo films. Actually, a good friend of mine, Neil James in Newbury, he's kind of the grandfather of of the photo film idea, and he does them superbly well. Um, you know, so I will do not every wedding, but I will do a slideshow essentially set to music, um, and they go down really well. And I have one on my homepage. Uh, 20 images and really I'm using that as a as a tool to to kind of filter you know I can't I essentially say to them press play look at these 20 pictures and if you like them carry on if you don't go somewhere else Um, but from a Google point of view it's very clever too because they are interacting with your website and Google likes that they like it when they do things and people are more visual these days Uh, you only have to look at um, the main news channels news websites sky news and all that kind of stuff you know, the days of static text and just random pictures are gone. It's mm. all videos and interviews with the, the, the um, news reporters and everything. People like that. People like to use it on their phone and, you know, and watch this stuff. Um, I tend to, I, I go down the route of doing a photo film and I will also put this, my favorite stills underneath so people have a choice. They can see the stills, they can analyze the stills or they can look at the photo film. Um, but when I do a photo, when anything to do with kind of move, what I I call it moving media. I don't know whether that's a technical term or not. Um, but when I do these things, I spend more time thinking about the audio and the sound, um, aligning the, the slide, the transitions to the beats and things like that, because that makes it very powerful, very powerful, especially the emotion stuff. Um, and, you know, you can you can really, really capture people's imagination by putting a good audio track to it. Um, like I say, Neil's Neil's great at that kind of stuff. Um, and is he is he, the, is he the guy that also does voiceovers on? His correct. Side? Yeah, and that's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Again, it's a motion, but coming from a different angle. Yeah. So Neil is used to be a Radio One DJ, believe it or not. Right. Um, and he's, you can still find things of Mr. Blobby and him on the Radio One road shows and what, what have you um, on the internet. But he, yeah. So he has this voice. He has this great voice. Um, you know, I. I sound like a drunk Joe Pasquale if I try to put a voiceover on my my um, stuff. So I don't do any of that. Um, I also don't record the speeches and um, the audio from the day. I have done it. Um, and again, Neil does this, as other people do. And they intermingle the speeches and, and the vows and everything with this, this photo film. And it's good. It does definitely set you apart. Uh, clients love it and they will pay for it. Um, but for me... It, because I'm, I have this like purist idea of this documentary photographer. I don't want to be going up to them and putting my hands in their pockets and wiring them up and all that kind of stuff on a wedding day. Because for me, that I'm just not comfortable with that. Um, but you know, other people do it and they do it really, really well. Um, but the, you know, this whole idea of the website and um, moving media and stills and YouTube and all that kind of stuff. Really, what I try and do with the website is make it a portal. I want it to be a place that people come. And they know that on a Monday there's going to be a, on a Tuesday there's going to be a new wedding blog. On a Monday there's going to be a why I love this image thing. Uh, you know, make it very thematic. Um, and you know, they may never buy pictures. Uh, you know, uh, they may never buy a wedding, but they might be interested in you know, Fuji. So they might be interested just generally in black and white photography, or they mm. might be interested in the audio of these things. Um, but make it a place that people enjoy coming to. You know, it's really important to make your website easy to navigate and easy to be on. Um, enjoyable, looks good on mobile, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, you get people who will who will appreciate it and then they will share it. And the sharing of the content is the most important thing. The social media sharing is super important. Um, but yeah, you know, kind of embrace all that stuff. Um, the, the fo- I enjoy the photo films, but it takes me so long to do them. I'm going back to that profit per hour thing. <laughs> I need to sort that out. <laughs> but one of, one of the... Um, uh, genuinely nice things I like about the, your sites in particular is um, you've got two audiences though, aren't you? You're a canny bloke, Kevin, because you've got the clients, but you've mm-hmm. also got the photographers and you are giving back, I think, in terms of explaining um, how you do things and your approach. 
Um, did the has the Fuji that association with Fuji was that a happy accident really in terms of you developing? It, it obviously suited your approach in terms of discrete reportage, yeah. not wanting to buy heavy big you know the one D up at your eye. Yeah, you are shooting more discreetly. Um, but how how do you feel that's adopting those cameras and working with Fuji? How does that help your business um, profile exposure? Yeah, I, well, it, again, there's two strands to that. In that it, yeah, it was a happy accident. I took delivery of the original X100 way back in 2011, I think it was. Um, you know, I took it to a wedding with me that day. It came in the morning. I took it that afternoon. I only took a handful of shots with it. And, you know, in, in fairness, it wasn't particularly good in those days. It needed, you know, firmware came and sorted it out. Um, but what I did do is I went home and I put those images online. Um, because I pre-ordered it so early, I was one of the first people to get a copy of the camera. I put it online and the next day I'd had 35,000 hits on my website. Emails from every, you know, it, it turns out that it was the first real world review of this X100 wow. on the internet, pretty much. Um, and so, you know, that, that was a complete accident. Um, but what happened in terms of using the camera, I realized straight away that there was a lot of potential with it. Um, and I really wanted it to be great, but it just wasn't there then. Um, and then they released the X Pro One and, um, I was I was writing for um, Professional Photographer magazine at the time, and they said, you know, do you want to review it? I said, yeah, okay. So they sent me a, a set um, with the three launch lenses, the X-Pro1. Um, and then suddenly it all clicked how this stuff was going to work for me. I didn't know at the time that, you know, I was happy with my Canon gear. They were producing good images. You know, I was really happy with them. But something just wasn't... I didn't know what it was, and I still don't really know what it was. But what happened when I got the smaller cameras... Um, was that I started getting closer, getting in closer, um, shooting the real types of images that I love to take, real close kind of, all this hugging stuff and the emotion and all that. And I wasn't doing that with the Canons because as soon as I got too close, people, and you know, clack, 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 big lenses, um, the opportunity was going away. And I, I'm very conscious that I never want to interact, I never want to interfere with anything. Everything, you know, of course, sometimes people see you and they do, you know, they react to you. But, um, you know, I really want to, the clients, when they look back at their wedding pictures, to think, yeah, do you remember when that happened? Rather than, oh, yeah, do you remember when the, ph the photog photographer took a picture of us doing that? Um, and so using these smaller cameras, and, and it just so happened that Fuji at the time were the ones coming out with the stuff. If Canon had come out with a tiny mirrorless camera at the time, then I would have gone down that route. And, you know, I couldn't afford a um, Leica, and, but that's what was appealing to me, that, that whole idea. Um, and I couldn't shoot in a rangefinder, you know, fully manual rangefinder, just wouldn't have worked for me. Um, so these, these things were coming onto the marketplace that were, and I was seeing my pictures were, were different. I'm not necessarily better, but they were different. And, and I was really enjoying using them. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of went from there. And, and I embraced everything that they brought out. And in the end, they um, they asked me to do some um, something at the photography show, focus on the imaging or whatever it was at the time. Um, you know, can we use some of your pictures? Really like them. Um, and then they invited me to become, and I just said, yeah. And I, you know, I was writing, I was writing stuff, and I was, I was showing, I'm, and I like writing about things, and I like showing pictures, and I like saying how I shot things and stuff. So I was doing that. I was getting a lot of information, a lot of feedback from the community, and, and all that. And then Fuji said, you know, we'd like to invite you to become an ex photographer, um, which at the time I think there was like two or three in the UK maximum. I was certainly the first wedding one. Um, and now worldwide, there's a whole load of us. Um, and, you know, I'm I'm very proud of the fact that I only use Fuji equipment. You know, that's it. I don't have any Canon stuff anymore. I don't have any of it. Um, there's a whole load of ex-photographers out there who do, you know, you shoot a bit of both, mm. um, which is fine. But my personal preference is, you know, if you're to be an ambassador of some kind, then you should really embrace it fully rather than, than partly. Um <laughs> Well, that's my own personal gripe, I suppose. And, um, you know, the, but Fuji is a company of very forward thinking. They listen. Um, you know, I, I've been extremely lucky. They've, they've flown me to Japan twice where I've spoken to the engineers. I've spoken to the designers. You know, I've sat there with the guys that, um, that develop the color, um, uh, mathematical equations that deal with all the color and everything and these are the same guys that used to build the um, Velvia and um, Astia film stock in the day you know these guys are 
old old guys you know but, but they're the, the nice same thing. people I, yeah i think that comes across that i think there is an appreciation of that legacy isn't there absolutely Without, yeah the yeah and they certainly listen and you know they um they look at everything that's out there they listen to the people um I, you know I'm, I'm kind of used as a little funnel i think so i i will get a lot of information and i will feed it back to them they can't obviously ask every single person um, but they're very open on social media. They, you know, they, for example, at the photography show coming up in uh, March or April or whenever it is, they will have a big stand and they will have all of their product managers there. Um, even the guys from Japan will come over and they will stand there and they will talk to people. They will listen, um, you know, and, and they take it on board. And, you know, I've seen, I, I've seen things on cameras, prototypes of cameras um, that, you know, they said, do you think this will work? And uh, uh, the four of us that were there have said, no. And they've taken it away, you know, and they've added things that we've suggested. And and that's an amazing thing to mm. be able to, um, A, to be part of it, of course, um, but B, to, to know that they, you know, they've always got your back, really. Um, and as I always say to Fuji, you know, it's, although I'm an ex-photographer, it's not a paid, thing, it's not an ambassadorial, I'm not obliged to say good things about them. And I will say, you know, I will say what I think is a problem with certain things and stuff on, online. Um, and if, you know, if something comes along that is better and suits my business more, um, you know, and Fuji can't keep up with that, then I would move. Um, you know, certainly I don't I don't think a brand loyalty at the expense of client happiness is a good thing. But that move on their part to revisit the the emotion and, and some of the uh, just appreciation of analog film in the design of those cameras, mm. particularly the X Pro one, mm. because at this time when we've got this, you know, you've got uh, the Impossible Project. There's people hearkening back yeah. to film and analog for them to take the digital camera and give people that feel that aesthetic mm-hmm. and have that on their hands. It's quite a smart move, isn't it? Very smart move. I mean, I don't, you know, Fujifilm weren't really in the marketplace up until they started doing this again. Um, and of course, you know, I surround myself in, in the Fuji world, so I only typically hear about that. But, you know, uh, generally in the industry, the Fuji name is more prevalent now than it was certainly four or five years ago. Mm. And this is for the X photography or the X series. Um, and yeah, you know, but the interesting thing is the Instax printer that they do, um, this little kind of printout thing, is phenomenally successful. Absolutely phenomenally successful. Um, you know, and... And it's it's print, it's you know a little piece of paper comes out the bottom. It's instant, isn't it? You know these Instax, um, and you know and that's a great thing for them too. But they they absolutely took the bull by the horns, and I, I think to a certain extent it was probably accidental on their part. You know, a, a good accident in that how it happened and how mm. um, you know the X100 came along. I don't think they realised how um, excited people would be by it. Um, and you know the whole retro thing my my original x100 is is there um and this whole look and feel of it i i never had any um i kind of looked at the x100 in the beginning and thought oh yeah nice looking camera but does it can it do what i need it to do mm. um i don't care i would the reason why i love the x pro 1 so much is cuz it's a little black box that's all i'm interested in i don't care about the chrome and the the glossy bits and all that kind of stuff i like the tactile nature of the mirrorless cameras I like the fact that I can control everything um, without having to dig down into menus and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love the um, the black versions of the cameras. I typically have that. My um, my I don't have my X100T here, but if you saw it, you'll see I've got it all taped up in black um, because I only have a chrome version of it, and so it's all taped up. Um, and you know, I one of the one of the things I said to them a long time ago is, and as did lots of other people, is. You know, people buy these cameras, documentary photographers, reportage journalists, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they're not necessarily going to buy them because of what they look like. They're going to buy them because they're small and discreet. So if you can do black versions of it, then I think you'll find people will buy those. So you know, they did and, and they do sell. Um, but at the same time, they're also catering for the retro marketplace. There's a lot of people, especially in Japan. In Japan, the look and feel of the, the device is far more important than probably anywhere in the Western world. They're very much, yes, look, but this, this retro camera looks great, you know, which is great. And so in Japan, they're selling, you know, loads of them too. Um, so for the people who want that retro look and feel, it's, it definitely fits, fits the bill, um, but not at the expense of functionality, which is the, the important thing, you know. Yeah. 